Great. Good, good, good. Uh, hi, Sarabi, how are you? Good. How are you, Andy? Uh, I'm great. It's great to see you again. I'm just going to wait to make sure that we're getting everybody into the room. Um, and uh, that's all great. And just let people come in. Say hi, everybody, when you come in. Uh, well, what a treat we've got for today. Um, we've got the amazing Sarabi Venkatesh here with us. And we've spoken before, of course. And um, uh, sadly, we were supposed to get together a little while ago, but um, COVID hit and on all these kind of things. So uh, so thank you, everybody, for being patient. And But all good things do come to those that wait. And this is going to be a great a great conversation today. So oh, that's great. Everybody's coming in. That's good. good to see everybody. Um, yeah, and sorry for the little break we've had in the chats to say, uh, hi, Kim, great to see you. Uh, um, but we've got some amazing conversations uh, coming now, uh, and this is the first one, and it's going to be a corker. It's going to be a corker, as we say in the UK. Uh, great. Right, let's start then. Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Good to see you. Let's think about starting off then um, with hearing a bit about your story. I think it's always a good a good place to start and to hear about how you navigated your way through to where you are now and, and your understanding of what you do and, and the influences you've had and um yeah a bit about a bit of your backstory yeah um yeah so I actually didn't grow up um with dogs at home um but I did find um you know a couple of streety friends along the way um and then you know I think after I got married um and I sort of you know, my husband and I were sort of putting our home together. I think uh, we both knew that we wanted to have dogs in our house, um, but I think we were very unsure of when. Um, and then sometime in 2018, we decided to adopt our first dog, Luchi, uh, who's still with us. And uh, that was obviously a, a game changer. We had no clue what we were doing. We were your typical first time pet parents. Um, I don't even think the idea of dog parenting was a concept we resonated with then. I think it was very, you know, typical ownership kind of attitude, um, which obviously evolved along the way. Um, and I think a couple of months into getting Luchi, I think we felt that, you know, we definitely wanted to bring home a second dog. Um, you know, we wanted to be a multi-dog household. And then in 2020, we adopted our second dog, Mutton. Um, and interestingly, um, so I'm a big foodie, uh, which also got me down the whole path of uh, nutrition for dogs. But both my dogs are named after Indian foods. Uh, so the part of the country that I'm from, Luchi is actually deep fried bread. Uh, and you usually have it with a lamb or a mutton curry, uh, and that's mm. a staple. And so I have a luchi and I have a mutton because they go together as a dish. Um, right. So uh, that that sort of talks a little bit about how obsessed I am with food. Um, and so I think that, you know, obviously they're, they're the reason why I do what I do. Um, they've continued to sort of, you know, really inspire and influence and I think just show me how to do what I need to do, you know. Um, and so I think I, 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 I owe different parts of my journey to each of them. I think with Luchi, it started off, uh, she, she's responsible for my journey into dog nutrition. Uh, with mutton, she is responsible for my journey into dog behavior and getting me into, you know, my association with Bhaks and Sindur. Um, and so I think it's, I, I feel very fortunate to be in the spot where I have these two incredible teachers and mentors um, with me. Um, and so, yeah, so I've been, I've been, you know, formally sort of working as a nutrition consultant now for about a little over a year. Um, I did my nutrition diploma back in 2020, and then I so I was sort of working with different pet parents in a very pro bono kind of capacity. Um, and then I decided to take a leap of faith last year, quit my corporate job, and said, "Okay, this is what I want to do." Um, and I think again, it came from a very strong place of wanting to build a legacy of what I had learned from my dogs while they were around and with me. Um, and so that it could be this kind of, you know, um, this really like fruitful relationship where I'm learning what I am learning from them. 
uh, sharing it with other pet parents, learning more and coming back to them with that. Um, mm. And so that's that's been a little bit about the journey, yeah. Is it, I think um, when we uh, allow ourselves to continue learning from another, whether that's the dog, whether that's our mentors and, and from our clients and staying in that kind of humble space, it's such a great space to be because we, we constantly learn and we keep building things up with, with um, and also, you know, having, so having that influence with Sindor, how did that mm. come about? Was that just by chance? Had you heard of her work? Had you gone down a different route first? How, how did that connection come? Yeah, so um, I think sometime early 2020, before we adopted Mutton, we were fostering another dog uh, for a brief while. And it was the first time we had a second dog into our space. Um, and I think that I felt very ill-equipped to manage things at home, manage their interactions, manage their dynamics. Um, you know, this was also a dog who had come from an extremely neglectful traumatic background. Her trauma was very, very visible in, in behaviors. And um, I don't think I did a very good job of responding to that and, and supporting her through it. And I think that I continue to feel very inadequate um, and guilty about that. Um, and so when I knew that I wanted to bring home a second dog, I also knew that I had to build capacity in myself to know how to do this. Uh, and what I was very clear about what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to go down the path of um, obedience training. I didn't want to go down the path of, uh, you know, the philosophy where, you know, the human has to be the alpha and has to, you know, uh, you know, the, the whole power dynamic. I didn't want to go down that path at all. And I think I felt very strongly in my gut that I, I wanted to learn how do you, how do you actually just communicate with dogs and how do you build a relationship that's, that's based on connection. Um, and, and I didn't want to, I wanted to keep it really simple, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, I happened to sort of come across uh, the Barks page on social media. And, um, you know, this is also at a time when I think that I was being bombarded with messages of a certain way to build relationships with dogs, right? And so I actually did feel that I was probably crazy to think that there is another way to do this because it seemed like there wasn't. Um, and I was probably being a big softy uh, by thinking that, you know, you can build relationships and you can coexist with dogs in the space with just connection and, and kindness and love. And so when I came across uh, the parks page, I was like, oh my God, here is someone who gets it. Uh, and so... I think I immediately signed up. I did the short-term course. Um, while I was doing the short-term course, we adopted uh, Mutton. She came to the house, um, you know, and then of course, you know, Mutton came with her own baggage and, 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 and trauma. And so I think the Bach's way sort of really became something that I started practicing actively and I saw mm. results. Um, and then I decided that I definitely have to do the, the back bed diploma. And so that's been that's been a journey. And I'm very, very close to the finish line. Very, very close. So, yeah. Well, that's brilliant. I think well, hearing you talk there and hearing, hearing the passion with which you connect those bits that are foundational for your story, of course. Uh, there must have been a big part of you that was... Um, even in your corporate world before, there must have been that side of you looking to connect to more, <clears throat> looking to find something on a very almost spiritual and emotional level. And then I think dogs give us that sometimes. We don't even know we were looking for it until we find it. And then when you have somebody as, as amazing as Sindor come along and help unlock that, because we can only really truly hear if we know what that language is. And uh, and I think that's, mm -hmm. that's important for us. Uh, you mentioned about Lucci, about um, she mm. was the dog that you really thought about nutrition mm. for. <clears throat> so as a first time dog owner, right, to even start thinking, right, I want to get this nutritional stuff right. Where did that come from for you then? Where, where, where did that thought process start? Is that because you were already 
very mindful of nutrition and the role of food and the importance of food? Yeah, I think, I mean, no, I, I don't think it came from that place because um, I don't think I was very mindful of nutrition prior to Luchi. But I think what happened was, you know, when she came home, we we followed advice that adoption coordinators gave us, that the vets gave us, that, you know, our local pet stores, for example, gave us. And they all recommended feeding her kibble, right? And that's what we thought is what dogs eat. Um, and so it was either kibble or it was, you know, this uh, combination of, of bread or milk and eggs or something like that. And, and so kibble it was. But what was so interesting was that as soon as Luchi got home, she rejected the kibble. Uh, and we went through, you know, days of trying to find what is the right brand, what is the right flavor. Uh, and she would just not eat it. And even when she ate it, she didn't enjoy it. It, it, it. I could see that she was eating it because she wasn't being given a choice. Um, and I also felt like, you know, I think, I, I think her, her, her whole attitude towards me really was I finally have a home and is this the best that you can do you know and so I think I was really pushed into finding alternatives for her and so I said okay I'm going to start just cooking for her and and so I started looking up you know what human foods can we feed dogs and this is also when there was you know there were these constructs of human and dog food um and I realized that basically you could pretty much feed almost everything, right? And so I started very actively cooking for her uh, and she enjoyed those meals. And I think that, uh, I think that, I think two things happened as a result of that. I think one is, you know, I went down the path of also seeing how she was thriving on, on a fresh food diet, she came in with, you know, uh, a couple of skin issues. She came in with just general low immunity. She came in with a few gut issues. I think some of that resolved uh, over a period of time. Um, you know, I myself engaged with a canine nutritionist to get very specific guidance for her. And I was just mind blown at the fact that this could be a full-fledged profession. Um, and I think the more I started seeing results with her, uh, the more I felt like that was something that I wanted to do because again, it came from a space of, oh my God, I have I have experienced so much joy and so much positive impact from this route that I have to share this with others. Um, I think the second thing that happened as a result of this was I was really struggling to connect with Luchi. Um, you know, again, it came from a place of I was the first time pet parent this is the first time I had a dog in my care um, I didn't know how to interact with her I didn't know how to engage with her um, I think I was getting a lot of messaging about how you're supposed to you know keep them keep dogs active at all points in time engage them constantly otherwise they'll get bored they'll get anxious uh, and it just seemed like I have to do a lot to you know, just connect with her. And I don't think that was something that came very easily to me. Um, and even the times that I did do that, I, I think I just felt very out of character and, you know, not authentic. Um, and so what happened with when I started sort of cooking for her and when I started making this food for her is that it actually became um, a way for me to connect with her, right? It became a way to establish this love language um and i think that i think that now that i look back at it like of course like you know i have a light bulb moment because food is really my love language right like i i love to cook for people i love when family friends come over uh for me and i and i think andrew you and i were chatting about this with reference i think to your mom as well the last time we spoke that you know the sign of a what what makes me feel really happy is when I have people at home and they and they say that oh my god we can't eat anymore and I'm like no 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 there's space for just a little, <laughs> little bit more right and uh, I think that's my language um, and so I think mm. I also felt very suddenly I felt very secure in being able to extend that language to another being 
I'm sharing space with, right? And 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 here is another being who loves this, who's reciprocating uh, in so many different ways. Um, and so I think that was a that was a real game changer for my relationship with her. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty powerful, you know, because, you know, we, we all do it. Um, <clears throat> time, strength, and everything else. It's like, oh, the dog needs feeding, bung it in the bowl, off we go. Uh, what you're adding there is actually this deep connection through the, the ritual of and the joy of providing food for another, which we all can recognize. You know, I love when Kieran, my husband, and I have the chance to have a bit of time together. I love getting in the kitchen, cooking something special and uh, and that kind of thing. And you, you're extending this to the dog. And I think this is really important. And and I, and I this uh, many of us, I think, can relate. Um, I do wonder whether uh, here in the UK, especially some of the rituals around food, we're losing them. You know, when I was growing up, you know, I was expected to sit at a table for dinner. Uh, we were expected as a family, doesn't matter where we were, uh, to get around that um, dinner table on us for a Sunday lunch because that's a big thing here for us in the UK. Sunday lunches and uh, and 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 I've got great fond memories of that. As you say, it's it is that connection that we had. And uh, uh, dear Sandy, Sandy's in the group. Hi, Sandy, Sandy Sharma. We talked about this because you know we kind of joked that if ever our mothers had met in heaven because they're both up there now, sadly, um, who would be the host and who would be the guest? Because my mother was the one who was like. <laughs> You know, yes, there's always room for more. I used to say to my friends when they'd come over and mum was saying, do you want anything to eat? Do you want anything? I said, just, just say yes. Best to say yes. Uh, <laughs> but they love putting on a spread. They love just kind yeah. of providing. And and why shouldn't we extend that to our dogs and that relationship? So I think there's two strands we need to think about here then as, as we go on. And I'll let you choose which, which one you want to go through first, because there's two bits for me. There's one, and they're both important. Uh, one is... Um, the relationship we build through food, because that's what I'm hearing you talking about. I think there's a lot to think yeah. about there. And the other side is that the important role of nutrition. Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, when we've discussed before, I think th there's a little joke, isn't there, that the three things you should never bring into a conversation, religion, politics, and yeah. what to feed your dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because then we have, but, but actually we need to move away from that and actually think, well, it doesn't really matter about what you feed. And obviously people have different budgets and different abilities and all yeah. sorts of things. It's about just thinking about the nutritional quality of that yeah. based upon those metrics. So which which one do you want to go through to first? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm partial to the first one. <laughs> Maybe yes. we can cool. we'll come back <laughs> talk to the a little bit about one, that right? first. <laughs> yeah. Yes, let's do that then. Yeah. So, sure. so what yeah. I love about this then, so you're already setting the scene really about how important food is and... And remembering for us how important food is for us. We, we have mm. to eat mm. because of biological need. And if it was that simple, we wouldn't have these rituals around food. They wouldn't even be there. We'd be just be doing the kind of getting a packet out of the cupboard and adding water to it like they do in the sci-fi films. As a species, regardless of where you are in the world, one thing that unites us all is the rituals around food yeah. and how important they are to bring people together, that notion of breaking bread and and yeah. share um and that has an important effect doesn't it about the way that we've ended up using food in relation to dogs mm -hmm. yeah i think it's i think i think it's it's complicated right because i think i think some of our relationship with food and dogs perhaps also has um you know, foundations in how our really our own individual relationships with food has also evolved, right? Um, I, I think today we see as a result of, you know, social media, and I think just conversations around fads and trends and etc, that we do have a very pro problematic relationship with food in general, right? It's not like, um, you know, all of us have very healthy relationships with it. I think it's not easy when we're constantly bombarded with uh, images and, and ideas and, and messaging around, um, you know, food that makes you lose weight, food that makes you put on weight, um, and, you know, just this whole diet culture. So I feel like th there is so much, there is so much toxicity right there that I think that, you know, uncon I think unknowingly perhaps we've also imbibed some of that and maybe that translates to some of our relationships with dogs as well. Um, and I think just to, you know, I think, I, I think just to sort of talk a little bit about what we were sharing um, before this chat, I think 
you know, the idea that you recognize how important food is for another being. And then I always think that you have a responsibility, right? You can use that knowledge very responsibly. You can use that knowledge uh, to, you can use that knowledge to build connection. You can use that knowledge kindly. You can use that knowledge with compassion, or you can use it to exert certain control. You can use it to exert certain power. You can use it to, um, you know, engage in this sort of power game, right? Um, and I think that uh, I think that that's what we kind of see. That's what we see different groups of people doing, right? We have people who do the first way, but we also have people who do the second way. And I think that one that tells us that could potentially tell us a little bit about our own individual relationships with food, but I think it can also tell us a lot about uh, how are we making dogs feel? What is the relationship that we're building between dogs and, and food right there, right? Um, so, yeah. That's important, right? And um, <clears throat> it makes you think about a lot of things that there, there, it wasn't that long ago that a main narrative from the positive community was if the dog wasn't engaging with the training enough to actually hold back on their food so they were hungry, hungrier. Uh, and, um, and there are still some people who say that now who, who are on the positive side of things because um, they see the fact, well, we are using food, so therefore it's okay, but that dog is, you know, that primary need is being connected to something that the dog must do. And, and, and we've, we, can, we can, if we're not careful, end up treating food as some part of a transactional process. Uh, and I think that's the thing that we need to question more, really, about what that is. And, yeah. and especially when we think about from the very early age, the dogs who are, especially when we're using a lot of um, food and a lot of reinforcement, what we're connecting to that young brain regarding their ability to access something that's quite primary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and and so I think that when, you know, we, we talk about a couple of different things, right? We talk about this idea of withdrawing food um, in, in certain situations. We also talk about other behaviors where we're constant, where we're either getting really handsy with food or we're choosing to, you know, hand feed dogs in, in different ways, right? For whatever different reasons. And I think a conversation that I was having with, you know, my sister and I think even my husband at some point in time was, you know, flip it for yourself, right? Imagine if you're sitting next to me and you're eating your dinner and I constantly put my hands on your food, right? Or I constantly hover around you, uh, you know, I'm really excitable around you, just create a lot of noise around you. Um, or imagine if, you know, you don't do something for me and I say, I'm not going to serve you dinner right? That's, that's what you get for not doing something. Um, that is, that's a very, very painful experience. I think we don't talk about it enough, but I think it's a very painful experience, right? Um, there is a lot of, you know, you withdrawing something that's very important, something that, um, you know, it, something that's meaningful for someone from them. And that's a very painful experience, right? Um, I think it also builds just so much insecurity around around food i think it builds a very poor trusting relationship with food and and even even the human at the other end of the the relationship right um i think that i saw a lot of this with with mutton when we got her home where i think you know she did come from an extremely neglectful background and i think she was so one, I don't think that she she had access to to proper nutrition, um, but also, I think that there there were um, there were you know problematic behaviors around food with her, um, and so the first couple of months she would just she would just gobble her food down because she was and it, there was a certain there was a certain frenzy about the way that she was eating food. It was almost like she wasn't sure that she was going to get another bowl of food right um and that's painful to watch but that's also extremely painful um for anybody including our dogs to experience right this idea that something that i need to survive something that i need to thrive is not going to come to me um or can be taken away from me at any point in time is painful 
Um, and I and I think that maybe maybe we can create more space to sort of talk about that because I think that perspective often gets missed. Yeah, I might have rambled on a little bit, Andrew. <laughs> no, I, no, I think it's great. And I think, <clears throat> well, let's build on that a little bit more because I think this is important. And, uh, you know, these are just questions and things to really step back and do um, because it's not a case of, um, you know, not using food. It's not a case of the, it's just, it's just thinking about how, what relationship um, do we build the, using something that we, we talked about off air that you said part, part of our building a positive relationship with food mm. what relationship are we building up with food with with our dogs <clears throat> you know we we went out recently and um uh my husband and i we took the dogs we had a picnic <clears throat> and for, normally we're fighting the dogs off right because we because like no, you've had your bit this is our bit you know we just want to eat our picnic in peace and we said to each other you know what? if we want a picnic in peace we go out without the dogs then let's just take some stuff out and share and they were so different and it was a beautiful moment actually it was just nice we were just having sharing but obviously it was dog stuff the dogs could have of course but um <clears throat> and it was a really lovely moment and uh it felt a very kind of a very relational instead of transactional. We weren't asking for anything. We didn't say sit first or anything like that. We we're like, you can have this big, have this bit. Um, and even with Molly, who's very much, uh, I've got to have everything. <laughs> first, she's a diva. Uh, she was like, no, I get this. I get this. We're going to wait. And interestingly, what was really interesting for me is with two Labradors, we've got three dogs, two Labradors, all up there if you haven't seen them. The change in their drooling, right? I said yeah. to Kieran, because normally the, the the two Labradors, as soon as they think something's coming, the floodgates open. But they, it was almost like they were more mindful in that experience because they just, the dribbling had stopped. They were like, okay, I'm waiting for my bin. I'm, am I having some of that? No, that's okay. It was just a nice experience. I thought I'd share that because I think this is the thing about what we do. Um, we lose that opportunity if we're uh, sometimes with yeah. our dogs. Yeah, I mean, I, I resonate with that so much because I remember when I started my journey with parks, one of the things I wanted to get support on was Luchi constantly whining when I'm eating food, right? Um, and, uh, you know, how do I, how do I address that? How do I, how do I manage that? And I remember Sindhur in one of her conversations, just saying, sharing your food is absolutely okay. You know, when you want to share your food, you share your food. And when you don't want to share your food, you gently communicate boundaries, but it's absolutely okay. And I, and I think that I was actually waiting for someone to give me permission to do that. Because again, there is just so much misinformation about, you know, the human, the food and the relationship with the dog, right? Um, and so I think that it's been it's been it's been such an incredible um, such an incredible lesson for me because I think you were again talking about rituals for food. So my dogs and I have a monthly pizza party ritual where once a month uh, I'm I'm home alone and so I get pizza, I order pizza, and I enjoy it, and my dogs enjoy the crusts, and it's our little thing and I love it I absolutely love it right um and I and I bask in in the joy of knowing that um this is something that I share with my dogs that are uh, that my dogs share this with me and you know it's something that they just know they're going to have access to right and I think there's an incredible amount of security and safety in knowing that which I think is again very very important for just you know well-being as as an overall piece yeah it's nice, but this is the this is the you know you talk about food as that kind of love language and it does seem to elevate us we were talking off air you know as a as a species evolutionally there came a point where one family unit and another family unit started to share food it's like well i've got i've got some you know coming in there and and underpinning that the, when we started from an evolutionary point of view looking at cooperative care and how that that's how we became social and it's, it's almost embedded in the notion of being social that that thing of sharing and interestingly i caught my husband recently doing what i do so i thought it was a me thing but it's a him thing as well so 
we've got three dogs <clears throat> and if we end up in the kitchen we've got like a child gate into the dining room it's a bit open plan otherwise and if there's just one dog happens to be in there for whatever reason we go <laughs> and, gate, and, and let that one dog come in and it can have extra blood, right? Yeah. And I caught Kieran yeah. doing it with one of our dogs, and I do the same thing. And um, the thing is, we do it with all our dogs. It just happens to be the dog that happens to be there. Right? At different times, yeah. Yeah, so it's that special moment, isn't it, of how we're yeah. going to just communicate through food, actually. And, yeah. uh, and especially with a lot of the dogs um, that I work with who, you know, are clearly have experienced trauma or are definitely in a traumatized state. And they come into the home and uh, I see a lot of pressure put on through food. And I think this is a big thing we have to recognize, especially on our side of the fence, that you can force through food just as much as you can force through anything. You can make a dog do something by mm. by food, you know. Uh, and actually, I think for a lot of these dogs, the free provision of food without expectation behind it uh, yeah. is a big part of having that kind of trauma informed approach, I think. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? I also think that, I mean, food's just such a basic need, right? Like there's no, there's no argument to it. You need it to survive, right? And imagine having to sort of work for something that is basic, you know, or imagine having to earn something that feels basic, right? Um, and, you know, again, I think that there's been so much conversation even in the group, right, about secure attachment, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know it it i think and and this is this is you know this is obviously in context of food but also i think this, the same logic applies right imagine having to earn connection from someone who you love right it, mm. there, there is something painful about that right there is mm. something that feels this is not okay right and and so i think i i sort of apply that same logic to food and dogs because it is really mm. basic um, and so, you know, if you if you put it in the context of human beings as well, imagine if I have to if I have to score a certain amount of you know score a number of marks or score a certain grade to mm. be to earn a decent meal, right? Like that doesn't fit right at all. Mm. Um, and so I feel like, yeah. You I was going to say we can we we can all relate to that. Many of us as adults still have painful memories of how certain foods were forced on us or was put through a transactional process. A lot of it yep. on that pre mac principle of, well, you can't have that or you can't do that until you have that. Uh, and I get yeah. that. You can see, see why our parents might do that because well, you've got to eat food because I've cooked you anything else. But what are we teaching that young brain then about the connection through food, about agency, about choice, about, about being able to experiment with food in a way that feels comfortable? Because guess what? We Many of us grow up still not liking broccoli or greens or Brussels sprouts or rice pudding or whatever it is that we were kind of made to have to sit through. Yeah, yeah and, and I also think that, um, and again, right, like I, I'm, I'm sort of still reading up about it and still learning about it. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak uh, to this with, with, you know, authority per se, but I think we're also, we're also teaching I think dogs, and again, you can equate this to children, to not listen to their body, right? And not listen to what they're feeling inside their body. Mm. Um, and so, for example, for me, I, I, find, I, I just find the idea very, very painful of, of a dog feeling hungry, but not being able to access food because they are not being able, they're not doing something that they're being asked to do. Right. And, and so I think the idea that what you're feeling in your body needs to be overridden by an external piece is also problematic. Right. Um, it's also teaching. It's also it's also teaching perhaps dogs to suppress what they're feeling uh, or to move away from that. Um, yeah. And that that again is that again is, is taking away agency. Right. That's again taking away. Mm. Um, what they can choose in that moment. Hundred percent, and I think anybody who heard the presentation at the Dog Behavior Conference yesterday with the, with the um, case study that I gave, um, we used food, and as far as food was freely available, but 
because this dog uh, was has a bite history, has no contact with the outside world until they were rescued from Spain. So six years old, five years either in either chained up or in a compound, two years without any human contact. So it's quite an extreme case. We had to make sure as we were moving forward that this dog was learning to feel safe, emotionally safe, socially safe, as well as you know, kind of safe in the environment. Yeah. And actually, if we'd have used a lot of food, we would have muddied those waters about how that dog was actually feeling and connecting to things. We had an experience recently with a rescue that I kind of help um, kind of remotely just they were talking about things. But they got a dog who was in and they did a lot of food training and they went in the, um, and they the, the kennel um, uh, person uh saw an emotional response from the dog that they thought oh at last the dog's really pleased to see me and they went to pet the dog and the dog bit them because that response was to the fact they had their food pouch with them mm. because that was the only thing that that dog was kind of connecting to was through the food you see rather than th th so there was a mis and misinterpretation there of that dog actually making a safe social connection so I think yeah. we have to just consider these things. And um, this notion of forcing through food, you know, we can very easily, uh, we have to be mindful of that as practitioners, of course, turning up. You know, I like to feed from the environment. So mm -hmm. it's there, you can have it, not have it. You know, I'm not yeah. going to treat in front and say, come on. And a lot of caregivers fall into that little error, don't they, where they give the treat to the guest and then the guest gives the treat to the dog. Mm -hmm. I think to myself, you know, if somebody was really, hungry or, or or very in need of some money uh, but they were also very sensitive or unsure or anxious and I say well and I'm trying to be helpful I'm like here's the money I've now forced them into my space to have to get it it's tough uh, so we just have to yeah. be mindful of these things I think about how we build this up and especially for young dogs you know with Molly uh, you know she mm. came to us quite young uh, we used hardly any food Actually, I say it's not about not using mm -hmm. food, food, right? but I didn't want to just be trying to support behaviors because I felt that's what I wanted. I wanted to try and let her show us what it is that she needed to connect and she could have the food anyway, because that reinforcement, yeah. um, always talk in those terms, is most powerful when that dog has an innate feeling of that work for me. And actually, I see a lot yeah. of memes which, is, which support positive reinforcement that say, you know, uh, use food because dogs do what works for them. We run a risk sometimes of just actually that should say dogs do what works for us because we're mm. using the transactional element of the food to get it. Yeah. Just got to think about it. So it's not about absolutes or rights or wrongs. It's just asking these questions about the relationship we build with food, especially from a young age. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think I think very much like you said, right? I think it's also about just I think being aware that the the presence of food can can give you very different behaviors, right? Um, and that's not necessarily addressing or responding to what the dog actually needs in that moment. Um, mm. And so I think you know, even in the example that you're talking about, where um, the dog bit this particular individual. Um, it is that, right? I, I don't know, and, and I could be wrong, but I, I see that happen so much where we're using food to get certain behaviors without really addressing what the root cause of those behaviors are. And the root yeah. cause could, could lie in exactly, you know, your example, it could lie in the need for feeling safe. Um, and food can help with that, but when done slightly differently, and when done again with the, you know, with the pillars of choice, with the pillars of agency, with the, you know, with, mm -hmm. with managing our own behaviors around food uh, and the kind mm -hmm. of relationship that we're, we're building. Um, and, and, you know, something that comes to mind, I think when you were talking about your case studies were uh, when we got, got Mutton home, she showed extreme resource guarding around bones and food. Um, and a popular advice that we got, and, and perhaps we also got this advice because she was, I mean, she is a pit bull type dog, was that if she refuses to share the bone with you, or if she refuses to let you touch the bone, 
you take the bone away completely and don't give it back to her right she has to learn to share um and i cannot tell you how uncomfortable that advice made me mm. because uh, and again it made me uncomfortable for a lot of different reasons but again i drew a lot from my experience of of teaching um children in low income communities when i was thinking about this because you can't meet scarcity with more scarcity right? yes you can meet scarcity with abundance and it takes time to shift that mindset it takes time to shift mm. an individual including dogs from that scarcity mindset to a mindset where they feel safe and secure and know that there is abundance available for them mm. uh, uh, and it takes up it takes us to show up in in more ways than one consistently uh to make them feel that way and to make them believe that that's true of of their home and their relationship with us um and so that's something i think a lot about for sure yeah that's powerful and i think you you're right and i think what you were saying before also about um about <clears throat> the fundamental question i think it underpins actually sarabi what what everything we're talking about not just you and i but all the conversations that are mm-hmm. going on a lot of the conversations in, in the dog center care group is that uh it isn't about training isn't about using food it's about being more mindful about two things one what the dog was trying to communicate in the first place especially yeah. in the notion of safety and feeling relief or whatever it is that they need and secondly if we're going to look at the behavior change of another you know that term behavioral modification we use it a lot it's, good, it's quite a free one but actually it's a term i feel really uncomfortable with because what it implies is mm-hmm. i am going to turn up and i'm going to make the behavior of another change yeah. But that is kind of what we do, and that's kind of what the um, you know how things are. So we have a huge responsibility to ensure then that that animal is still able, whatever animal it is, to get the safety and relief they seek. Not just getting them to give another behavior that we might find appropriate and use something as primary as food in order to get it, because that's mm. a double whammy. If the dog still doesn't feel safe, still doesn't get relief. Uh, so can't even get the relief they might have got. A lot of these behaviours that we might see is challenging. There's probably an element of relief from it. That's why they do it. Yeah. Um, so not only can they not do that now, <clears throat> and potentially the feeling of not feeling heard, but also they're having to think, well, you know, I need the food though, so I need to do that. And um, yeah. uh, and it's, it's tough. And I think it's it's just a thing that we have to think about. And I went through a long time of unpicking this in my brain i think the advantage of coming relatively new to things and having a great outlook like this is is it, uh you know a lot of my colleagues have been looking at things through a certain lens for a long time and it's hard then we have to all go through this period of reappraisal and think i need to ask some questions and i think that's another thing that underpins, underpins these conversations is why can't we ask questions why can't we mm. why do we have to sit and think okay that perceived wisdom shouldn't be unchal- shouldn't go unchallenged we should just think well, let me let's think about it then you know is this actually supporting the dog's needs or is it because mm-hmm. we've got really geeky about the science of behavior change yeah for behavior change sake yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and and i think again right and i think another example that comes to mind is you know luchi has very specific preferences mm. um with food right and and she she prefers certain textures uh she prefers certain foods over other foods um and some of it has to do with you know obviously just her preference but some of it also has to do with her just i think listening to her body in terms of what she needs right and um our dogs all of our dogs carry that wisdom right they do carry that wisdom um mm-hmm. and so you know there are times when she will leave some parts of her food and there are times when she will lick her bowl clean um and i think that for someone else who's looking at her and and her eating habits i think it's very easy for them to label her as a really fussy eater and then go down a very very dangerous path right um 
but I think that again, because you know, I think I I I I have this whole belief of food being a love language. I I I I feel like food is a connection with other beings. I think for me, this is just information, right? This is just her saying, listen, something about this meal didn't work for me. I don't like it. I don't want it. Something about this meal worked for me fabulously. Mm -hmm. And I think it is my responsibility as her caregiver to be responsive to that information and Mm -hmm. to make changes. And I feel like, I think that's also a trust building process. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think back to, you know, something that you were talking about being forced at certain kinds of foods and, you know, as, as, uh, you know, if if you were forced at something, you didn't like it, you didn't feel good about it, you voiced it, but somebody didn't hear it and they gave it to you repeatedly. Mm. Uh, right? It does it does lead to certain breakdowns, no, in that relationship. And so mm. I think I think there's a lot of it is a lot about how you you approach those behaviors. It is a lot about I think if we if we if we suspend this notion that our dogs are out to get us in some ways or the other or are trying to sort of take us for a ride or, you know, take us for granted and are just really acting as individual beings, just like very much like mm. we will, we do and, you know, kids do. I think it can, it can really shift perspectives um, for us. That's so much, but also big part of what you just said there has just made my brain go ping, right? I I love these conversations with people who are like yourself, who are are willing to come and share their passion and their knowledge because it's it's fundamental actually. And I've not really thought of it in this term and this way. So thank you for gifting that for me right now, because when you think about it, um, like you said, dogs have to have had instinctively over a millennia, the ability to try and find the food that they feel would be nutritious, that they feel would suit them in locations that they felt safe um, and seeking the things out that they feel that they needed nutritionally because they you can't survive otherwise. And I think uh, how many times have d- does a dog who doesn't want the food in front of them, as you say, is then classed as fussy, how many times do we either think the, but you either have the advice of, well, just take it up, put it down later. If they're hungry enough, they'll eat it. That's really common advice. Or how often do people then start thinking there must be a GI issue here, a gastrointestinal issue? We better get this done, better get that done, get a veg. I'm not saying that isn't important to think about. Yeah. But I, I think about with Arthur, our older dog, as he's got older, especially, he has become more particular about his food, which is a different way of framing it rather than fussy. Uh, yeah. And um, and I think we need to. This is the beautiful thing about connecting through food, then, because you get that feedback. Bunging a bowl yeah. down on the floor, and whether they eat it or don't eat it, is very binary. Yeah. But experimenting with different foods, and and there's so much misinformation about foods. I think uh, which doesn't help, especially yeah. for a caregiver. Yeah. So that's really hit home for me, and really hit home for me. And I think um, this is such a fascinating area, isn't it? When you think about it, then actually, when, when we're starting to think about the emotional experience of another, mm-hmm. uh, I've not really explored it in my head that much about the food side of it. I've thought about food as in quality and making sure it's nutritious, but on whose terms is it nutritious? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the I just got from that. Wow. So that was powerful for me. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we are coming up to this. So let's, we've got, we've got a bit of time. We've got about 10 minutes though at the end. Let's just talk a bit about nutrition. Yeah. What, what is the areas when you think about giving advice on nutrition, uh, I'm guessing then there is the kind of on a piece of paper, what we should be looking for, but on this yeah. piece of paper is the dog's preferences, uh, and you know, their likes and dislikes yeah. and their tolerances and everything else. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I obviously won't get into too many details about it, but the way that I like to sort of approach this is um, essentially saying that obviously your dog needs to have variety in their diet. Um, The more you can incorporate fresh foods, the better it is. Um, And within that variety, I think you have to make space for what your dog enjoys and what your dog doesn't like. 
right? Um, and what your dog enjoys, do more of that. Uh, what your dog doesn't like, I mean, if it's absolutely critical, absolutely critical to their health and well-being, sure, let's figure out different ways to incorporate that. But if it's not that super critical, let it go. It's absolutely fine, right? Um, and and so I think that you know again, I think dogs are listening to their bodies. I think their preferences and uh, you know choices change over a period of time. And so I think it's just important to I think fundamentally keep that in mind. Um, and and I think that not get so prescriptive about food, you know. Um, I think I've been there in my journey where I've been extremely prescriptive uh, in 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 food for my own dogs, um, and I and I do think that I lost the joy of just putting together a meal for them, and it became mm. this show. It became something that was inducing incredible amount of stress and guilt and pressure, um, and I think that. You know, of course, there are there are certain guidelines and there are certain requirements, and yes, you follow that. But it's all in balance. I think it's okay to not, you know, be as prescriptive as it's made out to be. Yes, and I think to be to break away some some of the expectational norms. I think, and you know. Uh, if anybody's listening who they feed their dog kibble, for example, and the dog seems to like it, that's great. And I think, you know, uh, even there you can think about um, something we do without even thinking about it, actually. And this fits with your previous point, how much food we give our dogs when we go out for walks. Mm. Mm. And that fits this notion of finding food everywhere. It happens to come from us. But uh, and, uh, and and even with our own dogs, we, we we tend to want to try and feed from the floor rather than you know um so that so they can have it or not have it but i think um you know uh thinking about how you feed your dog when you feed your dog who says that dogs have to eat at these set times out of a bowl you know that is something we've just done it's it's that kind of perceived wisdom it's convention but all these things that variety that you're talking about is not just in obviously mm. the food but also in what we do and if you do happen to feed people i've got some clients who you know from a socioeconomic point of view they, they struggle um they struggle with their own um so i've got a client at the moment who who struggles with her own her own care actually she has her own care challenges um and um you know so I, it's easy for her and but um i've been trying to persuade her and she has started to do put some extra bits in with the food the things that you do because then yeah. it doesn't feel like you're preparing something so, so there's lots of different ways of looking at this isn't there i think yeah i think again i think two things that i sort of really ground myself in um and again this is also something that i'm constantly reminded by through this incredible you know community of people that i work with one is that every dog is different and so mm -hmm. it's so 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 important to keep that in mind and and remember that what works for one dog may not work for another dog and while we have these guidelines and while we have um you know recommendations on what to feed and how to feed we have to tweak them for each and every dog for it to make sense for the dog um uh in 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 where they are right i think that's one i think the second one that um the second one that i hold is is for caregivers which is that everybody is on is on their own journey uh and yes. so this idea yes. that you have to move from A to Z immediately is, yes. is, 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 is an unfair expectation. It's an unreasonable expectation, right? So yes. if you're on your journey. I think as, at least for me as, as a professional, I, I feel like my responsibility and role lies in giving you um, accurate information, helping you make sense of it and seeing how much of it you can implement. And so yes. if we can take baby steps, that's progress right there. It's okay. We mm. don't need to get to the Z point right away, but can we at least move from mm. A to B and then slowly and steadily sort of move forward? But I think this, this demand that sometimes can be placed on caregivers to immediately switch positions is, is very harsh. Um, and mm. like you said, may not necessarily take into account their own individual uh, positions and, and challenges. 
I need everybody on the planet now to hear those words because I think it's important because there is an element of absolutism that's creeped into our community a little bit, um, you know. And it was the 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 rationale behind whatever it is, you know, that must be it must be done like this could be sound. It becomes unattainable to those who are not there. And if we if we have to educate in the way that you are, and this is what I try to do myself, in a way which is like, let's ask some questions, let's think about things, and then leave it to the other thing. What does that mean for me? What does that mean that I need to do? I, I see some of the conversations that we have around, um, you know, how we do certain dog sports, the, the, the kind of uh, talks around food, the talks around crates, all these kind of things. I think it's important that we try and educate in a way so people can make an informed choice and that has to be theirs and they shouldn't feel shame yeah. because they're not there yet but if they make that little change then they they it, it, invariably when you start a longer path you will end up going to the same destination yeah. we have to yeah. think about how we educate to make sure we're not even allowing people to step on the path the other end yet yeah. um so yeah. that's a wonderful beautiful sentiment and it's, and it's a great way for us to to finish um our hour that flew by didn't it i've got that so looking at the, the the kind of comments in the group it's been really well um received and um uh how can people find out more about your work darling well um i can i can add my website details uh yes we'll make sure we'll pages yeah 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 absolutely great well send me those uh, over ping them yes. over and then we can get them in chat but also when and I'd make a little write up for this later uh, because, you know, most people watch on catch up. So they have that thing. And of course, we've got the big dog behavior conference going on at the moment as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, and then I'll uh, also be getting this up on the YouTube channel uh, as well. So that'll have an extra hit. Well, amazing. I knew it would be. And uh, and thank you for your for sharing your stuff. I, I love talking. Um, everybody I talk to really um teaches me something uh and you've definitely got my brain thinking about a lot today and there's been dots that have been joined and i and i think looking at people in the group it's the same kind of thing so uh thank you for what you're how you're kind of offering things to us as a community and it's been an absolute joy thank you so much for the opportunity for the space for the group i think you're just incredible and Every time I watch you having conversations with people, I just learn so, so, so much about how you can have just authentic, real, meaningful conversations. So thank you so much for bringing that into every space. Oh, well, thank you. And, uh, you know, um, we've just celebrated our two years, of course, the group. I can't remember yes. where the time goes. <laughs> Congratulations. This is a great point you've made there, actually, which I think is something to really bear in mind for all of us. And this is the good thing about these conversations, because I think they're quite, they're democratizing these conversations because, you know, anybody who has a lived experience has something to say and contribute. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, this is really important. And there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, I know as a community, we like to claim things. But actually, what is unique is an individual's filtering of that information. And, and that's the gift. And if we stay available to each other and, and hear those things, yeah. um, we, we might get a closer to understanding mm. the reality for a dog but guess what mm. we're only we only know a fraction of a fraction about the human lived experience let alone another species Absolutely. so we have to stay humble and i think that's important well thank you darling thank you everybody um <laughs> we've got lots of people coming up uh but because i'm just getting back on my feet i will tell you names why not tell you names i think you see uh we've got jack fenton coming in we've got nikki french coming in uh, uh, the amazing Robert Faulkner Taylor, Dr. Robert Faulkner Taylor, he's coming back with his series. He's got Lorna, uh, Lorna Winter coming in to talk about uh, the amazing amount of data they've got from the Zigzag uh, project. We've got Jane Arden coming in uh, as well, um, uh, coming in, and um, Julie Daniels. So they're all under Robert Faulkner Taylor. Um, we've got Colin Spence's talk that's had to be rearranged coming up as well and lots of other things so thank you everybody enjoy the rest of your day afternoon evening wherever you are and thanks again Saravi see you soon yeah thank you so much bye